Glory Cloud Podcast, episode 160. Well, stay tuned for Meredith Klein's Theology, Women, and Church Leadership this week. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahey, and I'm joined by our co-host, Pastor Todd Bordeaux of Cornerstone Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. How are you doing, Todd? I'm doing great and ready to go. We were going to move past the introduction, which we've done the last two weeks, and we're going to get into it tonight. <laughs> As if we haven't stirred the pot enough already. <laughs> Wait till we get to marriage. <laughs> right. Well, we have more good stuff uh, on the agenda for today, so I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Anything you want to say before I dive right into the housekeeping? Nah, go for it. Okay. Well, I would just like to remind our listeners that we do have our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. There you can find all of the resources that we mentioned during the course of an episode. Uh, Todd and I would sure appreciate it if you would give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and to subscribe to the podcast on whatever you use to listen to it. Both of those things really help to boost our visibility to other people who are looking for good theological content in their podcasts. And finally, if you have the means to pitch in a little bit of money to help us cover the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can find a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right-hand side of the page, and anything that you can give is very much appreciated, uh, also very encouraging. And if you don't like the PayPal option behind the donate button there, just reach out to us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com and we can work something else out. And so having said all of that, Todd, how should we get off the ground with our discussion this week? Well, just to remind our listeners, we're going to use some terms that if we have any new listeners, you're going to hear complementarian and egalitarian. And in the context of what we are talking about, complementarian is the leadership in the church, the ordained leadership should be male. And if you're egalitarian, then the ordained leadership can be male or female. So when you hear those terms, that's what we're talking about. We're going to look at tonight, now that we've done two weeks of introduction, the key passage that has to do with women leadership of church leadership, and that is 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. And what I want to try to demonstrate is that one of the reason, reasons Christians, and especially Christian women, are moving toward egalitarianism is the way many what we might call hard complementarians are dealing with this passage and anyone who may disagree. Yeah. And what we've talked about before hard complementarians versus soft complementarians. Soft would be those who simply see that in the church the ordained leadership should be male and that these passages don't speak of um, a nature of, of women that's different than men that doesn't allow them to teach because they're too gullible, easily deceived. And so the authority that Paul speaks of in 1 Tim Timothy 2 is ordained church authority. That would be a soft view. The hard view would be that Paul is speaking beyond church authority. He's speaking of men and women in the church and male headship. And therefore that this applies even to unordained individuals. And so women teaching would not, women not being allowed to teach would go beyond who, who is in church office. That's sort of a generalization, but that's what we're going to be working with. Now, where Klein can help us is that Klein was never afraid to go where the scriptures went. That's right. And so we certainly saw this in Genesis 1, that if Klein doesn't see the six days as literal days and he sees a different view, whether that was the majority in church history that doesn't stop Klein from doing exegesis. We don't do exegesis by counting noses, he said to one student in class. 
Right. And even when I even mentioned last week within the confession, but Klein wasn't afraid to say where the confession of the church was wrong if he was convinced scripture taught differently. That's right. And so that's where Klein can help us because we don't have to be afraid to go where we think these verses are taking us. And so one of the ways that hard complementarians are pushing women to look into egalitarianism is when they suggest that this passage in 1 Timothy 2 is easy and clear, that there's only one way to interpret it, and if you don't agree with their interpretation, it simply means you don't want to submit to its difficult truth. And so there's sort of a fear of asking questions, a fear of challenging. And really, that becomes either intellectually dishonest or intellectually lazy. Mm -hmm. Because once you look at the passage, it's not an easy passage. And even historically, there's been some general applications that are the same, but some of the exegesis, how you understand it, there, there are varying views throughout history among conservatives. And so the egalitarians I mentioned last week, a lot of them are doing the difficult exegesis. They're, at, they're not afraid to ask the difficult questions, and people are drawn to that. And I mentioned last week, Roger Nicole is an example, another good example of an evangelical egalitarian who believes in inerrancy is Gordon Hugenberger. Mm. Do you know who that is? I remember uh, Meredith mentioning his name in class, but I haven't really run across m much of his work. He's an excellent exegete. I, I think he either was with Klein at Gordon Conwell um, right around that time. But it, when you read Hugenberger, he reminds you of Klein. So were they colleagues? I, I think so. I don't want to say for sure. I'm sure one of our listeners may know. Okay. But his work is excellent. Now, I don't agree with him on his egalitarianism, but he's an example of a conservative who's also an egalitarian. Okay. So there are some out there. They don't all lean to the liberal side. So what we're going to do is look, is, let me read the passage, and I'll show you why this passage is so difficult. The passage is, A woman shall learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. So let me just take some time. And, and I know our time is limited, so I can't get to all the questions and I know many of our listeners have never studied Greek, so I want to be careful there. But here are the questions about this passage. The first question is, is Paul addressing behavior in the assembly of the saints or for all of life? Hmm. So earlier in 1 Timothy 2, Paul writes that men are to pray with holy hands in every place. And so... One of the interpretive questions, does Paul mean in every assembly? And he's speaking of ministers who lead in prayer? Or is he speaking of men as, as a gender, you know, males, and everywhere they pray? Hmm. So you have an interpretive choice there. When Paul then addresses women and their dress, women are to dress modestly, uh, not in gold, etc., etc., which was what the wealthier women did, showing off their wealth. Is Paul speaking of how to dress in the assembly when, when we gather for worship? Or is he laying down a general rule for dress all the time for women? Mm. That's an important question. When, the next question, when Paul uh, instructs women to be quiet and then not teach or exercise authority, is he speaking of women in general or is he speaking of wives? Because as you know, the Greek word gunakai can be translated woman or wife. Right. Luther actually believed it should be translated wife. Hmm. So he thought this passage was about marriage. Okay. Uh, Hugenberger takes the same approach as Luther. Another question is, does Paul switching from the plural to the singular matter? 
when he speak when he speaks of women, for example, in their dress, he uses the plural. And then he gets to our passage on submitting quietly, and he says, "I do not permit a woman, not women." Is there any significance in that at all, or is it simply stylistic? Okay. The next question is, is false teaching in view here? One of the egalitarian arguments is that the false teaching mentioned in chapter 1 has not disappeared from the context in chapter 2. And so, if there were women who had bought into this false teaching, and they were teaching it, that the teaching they were not allowed to do was the teaching mentioned in chapter one. Hmm. That's that's a question. That's a a view egal some egalitarians have adopted. Uh, the next question: If we say it's women and not wives, what is the limit of this prohibition about teaching or exercising authority? Is Paul speaking again in the assembly? That as you gather, is he speaking all of life? Does this apply everywhere? And what are they not allowed to teach? Is he speaking of only the Bible? Or is this true generally, that women are not to have authority over men in other areas or in all of life? So would it be wrong for a woman to be president, for example? What, what, what is Paul addressing here? Is he only addressing church office and therefore authoritative teaching? The next question is, what is the relationship between teach or have authority? Some suggest we have what's called a hendiadis here, which is one idea expressed by two words. So the idea would be, I do not allow a woman to teach with authority. Hmm. In other words, he's only addressing a certain type of teaching. But if you don't go with that, if you think the or is separating two separate ideas, then what exactly is he saying when he says teach or have authority? Is he speaking of the two offices? I, I do not allow a woman in the assembly to be a ruling elder, someone ordained with authority, or a teaching elder or a pastor, someone who teaches with authority. Is that what he means? Or does he mean any type of authority in the church and any type of teaching? Notice how I'm not answering him right now. I'm just raising the questions <laughs> right the next question why does Paul use the Greek word authenteo when he says I do not allow a woman to have authority the normal word for authority throughout the New Testament is exousia that's used almost everywhere and yet Paul uses a word and we called that last week a uh, hapax legomena it's the, the only time it's used in the whole Bible and so a lot of people have done a lot of work uh, on what, why Paul is doing this, and they've done careful word studies on how this was used in the Greek world. And one of, in the range of meaning, one of the meanings is dominate. And so one of the egalitarian arguments is that Paul uses a word that has a unique meaning. So what he's saying is that I do not allow a woman to dominate a man. And so it's not authority in general, but a domineering authority or a domineering teaching. Or some of them take it, Paul addressing a wife. I do not allow a wife to dominate her husband. Okay. So does he use this unique word because he expects the readers to, to notice the difference? Or is it simply a stylistic choice just like in English, sometimes we use different words to say the same thing. That's just the way we speak. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he wouldn't expect them to think anything else but authority. Because the word does most often mean authority, but there is a range of meaning. Uh, the next question. Why is Paul appeal appealing to the creation and the fall in verses 13 and 14? Why, why does he bring the order of creation? Adam was created first, but so what? We have to understand, we have to ask the question, what does he expect his readers to get from that? Because when you look at Genesis 1, the very fact that man was created 
at the end of the first week. He was the last of the creation. Meant he was the apex of it. He was superior. And yet now the order, because Eve was second, would mean she's inferior. And yet is that a natural understanding of the order? Mm. Because right in Genesis 1, it was the opposite. Why, why is Paul pointing out that Eve was deceived? Does it mean that she had a gullible nature? Or did it mean that Satan targeted her? Is that the point that Paul's making? Is Paul making two points here? Is he saying that in God's order, man is first and therefore has the authority over women and because Eve was deceived, she had a nature that wouldn't make her a good teacher? Is Paul bringing two different subjects in to prove his point? Or is the Genesis account really pointing to the same thing? And what does Genesis actually say? Because Paul obviously expects his readers to get the reference without having to explain it. And so what did they already know about Genesis that you wouldn't have to read so much into it that it would be fairly cl clear to them? That's the next question. Hmm. Um... The Greek word for silent hesukia sometimes simply means calmness. Is that what Paul is saying? He wants women to be calm and not unsettled and uh, going after teaching? Or is there a silence? What does he mean by that? Uh, the next question, what do we do with the rest of Scripture where we have examples of women teaching men? Sarah three times instructs Abraham. And at least one of those times, God actually tells Abraham, listen to your wife right. as she is telling him what to do. Uh, and again, you have Deborah in Judges 4. Deborah is, is a judge. And it says in Judges 4, Deborah was a prophet and she was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. Now, the typical objection or the typical answer to this is God was using Deborah to rebuke all the weak men, for there were no men who would lead. The problem is it doesn't say that in the actual passage. You have to read that into it. Right. And it does raise the question, if it was unnatural for a woman to teach a man, why is all Israel, which is which are the men of Israel, going up to her to have her judge them and and teach them? Hmm. You would think the men of Israel would be very offended that they would, and it was a time of great apostasy and rebellion. You would, it is the book of Judges. You would think that if their understanding of Genesis was that women should not have authority, they didn't seem to have a problem with it, is my point. Right. What do we do with that, considering what some say Paul is saying about the created order? What do we do with Abigail? She teaches David, and she counsels him what to do, and David listens to her. Uh, Apollos listens to Priscilla. We have commentaries written by women teaching theology. We have hymns written by women teaching theology. How does that fit into 1 Timothy 2? if women aren't to teach the Bible to men. Hmm. What about when Peter tells slaves to submit their t to their masters? Many of those masters were women. Right. And so you have men submitting to female authority. Hmm. And so here's this, the point. This passage is not so simple. And to suggest there's only one solution and anyone who challenges it or have a, has a different view is in rebellion against God, is attacking the Bible, is simply intellectually either dishonest or lazy. Because this is a very difficult passage that a lot of scholars have spent a lot of time trying to unpack. What, what does that make you think as, as I go through just some of the questions?
Yeah, well, I think that um, the, the the folks out there that are saying that it's simple and that you just need to um, bend your knee and submit to the way they say um, it should be understood are going to end up um, with some uh, some blowback here. I think um, uh, you know you suggested at the beginning that um, this could push people toward egalitarianism and um you know sometimes uh when you're studying history uh you can see in hindsight that um the church made an unwise move and i'm not saying this is the whole church but this is obviously a very loud voice out there and it could have the effect of um creating a a large contingent contingency of egalitarians in the church which is ironic of course because that's what they're trying to stop from happening (laughs) exactly but i mean it's like telling kids growing up that they can't know you know that there's forbidden knowledge well what do they want to know as soon as they're you know old enough to figure it out on their own they want to know that forbidden knowledge um and it's this it's the same kind of thing here Yep. So what I'm going to do now is offer an exegesis of the passage. I'm not suggesting I have the definitive exegesis of the passage, but I've certainly studied very carefully all the Greek, and I I can't imagine anyone in church history at this point I haven't read of what they thought of this passage, including um, early church, the Reformers, and the Egalitarians. And, And I stick with the Egalitarians who hold to inerrancy that not the ones who say things like Paul didn't write this or we can't trust Paul because he was in a patriarchal society. I'm speaking of those who actually believe in the Bible and are trying to grapple with the text. Right. And I'm glad that you brought up both Roger Nicole and Gordon Hugenberger because both of them would be committed to inerrancy. Yes. So here is what I think the passage is saying. And I, and I hope this is helpful. And that is, we get what the passage is saying from our theme verse, which is chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Paul's concern throughout this whole section is behavior in the assembly as the saints gather. Okay. And so when Paul begins chapter 2 with men everywhere who lift their hands and pray, he's speaking of ministers who lead in prayer in the assembly. That would be the obvious connection with lifting their hands and praying. Uh, so the everywhere is everywhere the church gathers. Okay. When Paul speaks then of women um, being modest in their adornment, He's not suggesting there's never a time for women to wear wealthy clothes because if wealthy women have a husband who, let's say, is a politician and they have, you know, important dignitaries over, it would be expected for a wife to dress very fancy. Right. He would want her to, and that would be appropriate. But it wouldn't be appropriate to come to worship that way where you have mostly poor people. And so... Again, Paul is addressing dress in the assembly, not to come to worship and show off with your wealth. And of course, only the wealthier women would even be able to apply this particular one when he speaks of wealthy um, clothing and hairdos. So again, the focus is on the assembly, on the gathering of the saints, the household of God. So when we come to women allowing men to teach and have authority. Again, we're speaking of the authority of office in the assembly. When you teach in the assembly, that's a called office. There's authority involved, as Paul tells Timothy, you know, hands were laid on him to give him the authority of office. And so the remaining quiet is not all men to all, excuse me, all women to all men but listening to those with spiritual authority in the church, those who have been called and ordained to office. 
And then Paul appeals to creation. So Paul's argument here is that men should have the spiritual authority in the church of office, and especially in the context here of teaching with authority. And that makes sense why he appeals to creation. When he appeals to Eve being tempted first, he's not suggesting that Eve was created gullible, that she simply wasn't made for thinking deep thoughts or discerning truth. Because the order matters. Adam was created first, and yet Satan tempted Eve. He went after Eve to deceive her. And so if the only focus here, if the only point is that Eve was deficient and she was gullible and she didn't have authority or the nature to lead, what did Satan see? In other words, Satan was watching Eve and somehow figured out she was gullible hmm. and man wasn't. What would he see in her nature that would let him know that? And and. Is that really what we would see in Genesis without someone telling us? In other words, Paul expected his people to know exactly what happened in Genesis. Right. And so the point is that, we talked about this last week, there's nowhere that suggests when Adam and Eve were created that because Adam was created first, he was in charge of Eve. He had authority over Eve in some general sense. When Adam saw Eve, he said, this is the bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She was a helper to him. Even that is a strange way to talk if the patriarchalists are right. Right. And so what does Genesis actually say? What would Paul's readers be familiar with of what Adam was in charge of? Adam was in charge of the Garden of Eden. Adam, being created first, was given the responsibility of being the covenant head of mankind. He was the one that was given the test concerning the fruit. Not Eve, but Adam. He was made first for this responsibility. That's what Genesis actually says. And we don't have to read into it. We just have to read Genesis. Mm -hmm. And so Eve, when Satan came to Eve, she should have deferred to Adam because Adam was created with this responsibility. Uh, to, he was given the test to either eat the fruit or not eat the fruit. So Paul's point is, when God appoints a representative, and he appointed one in charge of the covenant of works, responsible for it, he appointed Adam. He did not appoint Eve. And so what did Satan do? He ignored the order. He ignored the covenant head, the one given in charge of the garden and he went after Eve to deceive her hmm. so the point is that Satan ignored God's order that he established who had spiritual authority in the garden of Eden and not only did Satan ignore the order but then Eve ignored the order and so the point is not Eve was deceived because she was naturally um, decept a uh, gullible the point was Satan ignored God's order for who was in charge of the covenant of works. Who had the spiritual authority at that time in the garden? And so Paul's point then would be, as in that time, God appointed a man to represent mankind. And when the second Adam came, God sent a man, Jesus Christ was a man, as the covenant head. And those with spiritual authority in the church, in that sense, represent God. They represent Christ. And in that continuation, that should be a man. And so the office, especially the office of minister, is to be a man in line with Adam and in line with Christ as a man. And so Paul's warning, which would be something the readers would all understand because they've read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, is don't ignore God's order for who is the one who is the representative of Christ here, of God. And in this age, that spiritual authority, that authority of ordination is given to men, just like the apostles were men. Now that, and, and I'm going to get your comments in a moment, 
that matches and and of course this is not an uncommon view i'm i'm this is not sort of i'm the first one to think this you can find this um in and i'll and i'll show you where most of all but this matches why women can teach men outside of the authority of the office mm. it's why it's why abigail could instruct david while still respecting him as the king she even calls him my lord with great respect for he's the one that's going to make the decision as the king. But within that, she could instruct him on what the promises of God said and what to do. Hmm. Because she's not violating his office by instructing him. Right. But that's why Priscilla could respect Apollo's calling, but still instruct him in the scriptures as he needed to be instructed. That's why women can write hymns and commentaries because they're not writing as those with the authority of the office. It's why women, uh, it's why Sarah could instruct Abraham while still respecting his role as the one who would then make the decision. And so it also matches the rest of 1 Timothy because right after this section on women, Paul begins 1 Timothy with 3, and now those who, to, who aspire to the office of bishop must be, and then the qualifications of the bishop. So chapter 3, there shouldn't be a sharp division in our minds as if Paul's completely switching ideas. Paul begins that women are not to be, uh, not to have the role of spiritual authority of ordained office. Now in chapter 3, the men who do aspire to this here is their qualifications. The husband of one wife, etc., etc. It flows right from chapter 2 to chapter 3 with the same theme. So Paul's point in chapter 2 is not creation shows us that males are to have superiority over females or that men are wiser than women and better teachers. Paul has respect for the office here and the office is invested with spiritual authority. And just like in the covenant of works, uh, the one who represents Christ, and, and of course, a Adam at that time represented mankind, but the one who has spiritual authority is to be a man that continues in this age. And Deborah was an example of every once in a while, God can overturn his own norms that he's established. That happens at times in the Bible. Right. But then the norm is to be um, a man. That's why in chapter 3, those who aspire to be bishop are to be husbands of one wife, men. So it's not about a superiority of men over women in general. It's not about a creational difference of women are, are easily deceived and poor thinkers or anything like that. It's about God's plan for men to represent him in this age with the spiritual authority in the church. And that's how you can bring this all together with what we what is now known as a soft complementarian position, complementarian position that matches the rest of scripture. Hmm. I'll take a breath and get your thoughts. <laughs> um, well, I really appreciated what you had to say um, about Paul's appeal to creation um, I mean, I guess I haven't really thought deeply about why he was appealing to it. I just noticed that um, in my conversations with real egalitarians, um, that that fact was something that they were not comfortable with. You know, they were hoping that it would be something much more cultural. And, you know, my question was always, well, why would Paul appeal to creation? And I really appreciate that it's it's really simple. Um when you read the Genesis account um, and that Satan was um, essentially just being as rebellious as he possibly could be. And so, you know, trying to subvert the, the order that God had established um, and that it wasn't anything more, um, uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but um, sort of uh, ontological differences, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Chris, that 
Many of the hard complementarians and the egalitarians end up making the same mistake about this passage because they both tend to think that Paul is speaking of more than office. Mm -hmm. So the egalitarians say that this applies more to men and women in general or in, in the way they teach or if they say marriage, you know, just generally all marriages. Hard comps tend to say this is a creational difference between men and women in the church and so even in areas outside of ordination, women should not instruct men. They go beyond office and they both make that error. I believe it's an error. They go to different places, but it's a fundamental wrong starting point. Hmm. Now, let's talk about support for this view. Now, if you read church history, the majority view is that women shouldn't teach men because they're created gullible. If you read the early church fathers or even most of the reformers, they tended to lean that way. Hmm. But that started to change, and, and one of the changes was in 1988, the OPC, my denomination, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, put out a General Assembly report on women in office. And what they did basically is reject the majority view in the, in the church that women shouldn't teach because of a creational weakness. So I'm going to read from their report. I'm, I'm going to sort of interject my own words because it's too long to read all, and I'll try to put it together. And our listeners can go online to the OPC site and read the whole thing. But in summary, they write, we reject the premise that the Creator has not equipped women for positions of authority and initiative in the Christian Church because of her constitution, that both in its strength and its weaknesses renders it inappropriate that she would have such positions. We reject the premise that men are rel relatively more important than women and that women are more susceptible to temptation or that women are easily misled and easily mislead others. Do any among us wish to defend this premise, particularly this ontology of women? They use that word, ontology, there. And then they write, we doubt it. Yet we dare say that because of deeply rooted cultural and historical factors that have found their way into the thinking and life of the church, virtually every one of us is under its influence to one degree or another. And as long as that premise continues to control and the decidedly unbiblical elements in its assessment of women persist, we will not be able to put the issue of women's ordination in proper perspective, nor will we be able to make necessary and constructive advances in grasping why Scripture prohibits their ordination. We need to be especially sensitive here to the apostolic injunction found in another context, do not go beyond what is written. Hmm. So here the OPC, very conservative reform denomination, is saying this is not about a different ontology in women. It's not about a, a, a gullibility in their creation, a deficit in their creation and they're saying that this was the common view that has been around for a long time that we must reject and it's done damage and then they go on to say this is about women's ordination and why they shouldn't have ordination and then they ended with and if you're trying to peer into exactly why be careful not go to go beyond scripture but it, scripture does teach here that men are to have the spiritual authority in the office in the church. Mm -hmm. Isn't that refreshing to hear? It is. I mean, that strikes me as um, refreshingly wise. <laughs> and so that's my point that I'm not the first one to have this view. It, it's not an uncommon view to think and believe if you read outside of certain circles that Paul is speaking of office here. Okay. Now that does raise a lot of questions that people then have. What about what women can do outside of the office? Mm -hmm. If unordained men are reading scripture in the assembly, can an unordained woman read scripture? If neither of them have spiritual authority? 
Well, if your view is Paul speaking of office, then you would say yes. If your view is Paul is speaking of men and women in the church, even outside of office, you would say no. Right. What about, can women teach a Sunday school class? Well, again, it depends on your view of that. Um, if you think it's office, then yes, because they'd be under the authority of the session in what they're teaching. If you think it's about gender, and it applies to men and women in the church in general, then obviously no. And it's not an easy question based upon what you do with 1 Timothy 2. Now, I'll tell you this. One of my favorite commentators is Karen Jobes. And if you've ever read her commentaries on Ecclesiastes or 1 Peter, she's one of the go-to commentaries if you have a number of them. She's one of the best. She has her PhD from Westminster in Philly. I'll tell you this. If she was teaching a Sunday school class in my church, I'd be in the front row. <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have my notebook out. <laughs> Now, with my view of spiritual authority, my understanding, I would want her to be under the authority of the session that what she teaches would be approved. But I say that because that's what I think is the point of of First Timothy 2. Now, if there are people in our church who had the other view of First Timothy 2, then it'd be a question of wisdom whether you should do that. But the point is there are two complementarian views that would come to different conclusions. And the bigger point, it's a difficult passage. Well, I believe historically the what the OPC said is right, that male ordination is in view, and that's been fairly clear. The other details and applications are difficult. What to do with Paul's appeal to Genesis 1 and 2 has been difficult. Mm -hmm. And we have to be intellectually honest and admit that very sincere people who study the scripture can have different views without compromise. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, this kind of goes back to what you said last week about just being able to say uh, to each other, well, I, I think your interpretation is wrong and, and just be able to have a discussion from there rather than, um, you know, to harbor these suspicions that, you know, the other side is, you know, has some nefarious agenda that they're trying to um, foist on the church. Uh, so. And, and maybe it's because they're the loud voices right now, but the hard comps, as we can call them, or the patriarchalists, they're not able to do what you just said, are they? No, no. Uh, now, saying that, I've read a lot who can, but the ones who are making a lot of noise right now aren't. Okay, so you have read some hard complementarians that can live with brothers and sisters who disagree. Yeah, I'm going to give some names in a moment. Okay. But what we're seeing now, and this goes back to how we opened the episode, why we believe that this type of um, response to even my view is is pushing women towards egalitarianism is is that anyone who questions it and i'll give you two examples that are seem to be all over the internet of of the type of attacks would be amy bird and, and rachel green rachel's a member of our church and they pulled my view basically what i just explained and and the opc's view in 1988 the um What's being said about them is, is it's a feminist attack on male headship, on the Bible, on the church. Uh, there's, there's sort of a fear-mongering going on. There's not simply a, a quoting them and showing where they're wrong. It, they, they, you know, it's very lazy, intellectually lazy, to call someone a feminist. There are so many meanings to that word. And to use it pejoratively... Um, you know, you have to do the you have to do the work. If you're going to critique fellow believers, at least do the work. Find out what they're actually teaching. Quote them, and then show. And what does that mean, feminist? Feminist. Let's not overreact and use these words. What is it? What are we, what are they saying? You know, a feminist can be someone who fights for women's rights in general. Right. 
or it can be the other extreme. But the type of responses out there, I you know, I heard somebody recently talk about Amy Bird's attack on headship in her new book. <laughs> A book that isn't even out that that no one's read. <laughs> you know, so you look at it, the title of a book, you don't even know what's in it. You don't know why she wrote it. And yet there's all these attacks of a feminist who's out to destroy male headship. So there, there's an overreaction that is raising questions. Mm -hmm. There's, You know, if you disagree with their interpretation, you're suspect. Which I think what women are sensing, they're, they're they're sensing something's wrong because among whether you call them hard complementarians or patriarchalists, there's a lot of different disagreement in different areas of theology, different views of eschatology, ah mill, post mill. Uh, there's different views of communion, pedo communion, not pedo communion. There's different views of baptism. These are important issues. Mm -hmm. And yet, all of them within conservatism, it's sort of among each other. And yet, if a woman questions their view of whether a woman can teach a Sunday school class or whether a woman is created gullible, and, and I'll do my best uh, Joker Dark Knight, Dark Knight imitation, they lose their minds. <laughs> right. And so, you know, if if you share your a, a view with another believer on things like election, justification, the sacraments, male ordination, if you share all these basic views, and the only difference is whether you think First Timothy 2 speaks of women's nature not being able to teach, or it speaks of church office, if that's your only difference and that's enough to, you want people to not read them or you're afraid of them, that it's a feminist attack, you've got the wrong priorities of what Christianity is. Amen. And so what's happening? Christian women are, are getting it. They're seeing the overreaction. They're seeing the inconsistency of what they allow to disagree with, with each other. And what do they smell? They smell misogyny. Mm. That's what they smell. And so what are they doing? They're looking at egalitarians. Because what are egalitarians doing? They're not struggling to at least look at the text. They're grappling with the text. They're not trying to overprotect one view of male authority. And the sad part of all this is that egalitarianism is not the answer. Right which I'm going to talk about before we close. But this overreaction to these ladies or anyone who tends to question their view of of ontology or their view of women being deceptive, uh, not deceptive, but easily deceived, this overreaction is causing people to wonder why. What are your thoughts on that before we talk about egalitarianism? Uh, just that um, it, it's it's kind of one of those common grace wisdom things that when you see somebody who's working too hard to hide something or to um, push a particular narrative, uh, you know, if you've lived long enough, then your your radar starts to go off that there's something wrong. <laughs> that you shouldn't necessarily trust this person. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't blame Christian women who um, are distrustful of uh, the, the sect that is promoting um, patriarchy and misogyny and, and things like that. Um, oh, I, I know. I was going to say, you know, they told me when I was at Westminster that basically the the ecumenical creeds defined orthodoxy and that it was violations of those creeds that qualified as heresy. And yet that's really the way, um, I don't know, I don't know what else to call them except our loyal opposition, um, is treating this issue of uh, women and authority uh, 
is as if it is in the ecumenical creeds. Now, <laughs> some of the issues you mentioned, like baptism and the sacraments, they are in the creeds. They're, right. worth, they're worth fighting over. <laughs> but authority and women are not in the creeds. Exactly. And, and what the creeds, well, they don't touch on this in detail, but there's sort of a given that, you know, when the larger catechism speaks of um, pastors, it assumes male. Right. It's, it's he. And, of course, at that time, that was the given. But all the details of why are simply not in the Westminster Confession or the Heidelberg or um, the Baptist Confession. So, Well, I was even thinking of the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the oh, yeah, Athanasian even, Creed. Yeah, even those. So let's, let's close then with why egalitarianism is not the answer. One, and, and I've read as many of the good ones as I can, they're all still missing the point of First Timothy 2 in trying to argue that it's either wives or it's false teaching. The context of First Timothy 2 and the greater context is church ordination, church authority. And if you miss the big picture, that's where they're coming up with these other answers. And, and they're really not satisfactory from a purely exegetical point of understanding the book. And, and the other problem with that is when you introduce the idea of women pastors, you're talking about 2,000 years of the church applying at the bare minimum 1 Timothy 2 as limits on male church authority or ordination. Uh, quoting one pastor, we have no evidence of any movement within mainline Christianity to ordain women as elders or as ministers in the Christian church. <laughs> and that's true. You had some sort of outline um, here and there, women pastors, but generally in the church you didn't have it. You had some Baptist women missionaries, but that, that still was a minority. So you have this serious deviation after 2,000 years, and it raises the question, if God always intended for women to be pastors, why did he not gift the church this way for the last 2,000 years? Right. Because God has promised to give the church everything she needs for life and godliness. And so why didn't God illuminate his people to see what the egals think scripture teaches? That there's no limit um, on women to have church office here. Mm -hmm. And it raises a question. It's the same type of thing that Pentecostals used to argue. When, when Pentecostalism began in the 20th century, Pentecost, well, what happened to 1900 years of the supernatural gifts having disappeared? How, how did the sign gifts appear at the end? Well, some of them argued, well, we're in the last days, and they misunderstood Joel too, that in the last days, God will pour out these gifts. Mm. Well, before long, it was pretty obviously that that generation wasn't the last days. So the argument began to be, and this is a common one today, that God's people had become so formal that they squelched the supernatural gifts mm. or the rel revelatory gifts. But now you have a question of God's character of promising to give the church everything she needed and then not giving the church everything she needed for almost 2,000 years until we were smart enough to figure out they had been wrong. It's, it does question the character of God. And so if you say that God has always wanted women to be pastors and yet for some reason he couldn't overcome uh, the blindness of the church until now. Why is God starving his church? Yeah. And I, I really haven't heard a good answer. And maybe there's some egalitarian friends who listen. I would love to get an email from them answering that question. But I think to me, it's a, it's a scary proposition to suggest this. That's a good point. So let's close. Uh, we're, we're a little under an hour. In summary, there is a view that avoids the pitfalls of the hard complementarianism as well as egalitarianism. Um, 
and that is to see that Paul is speaking of church office here. And so the high view in 1 Timothy 2 is not a high view of men over women. It's a high view of Christ in his word that only people qualified and called should have the authority to teach. And those people in God's plan are men. So the high view is not the sex of men. The high view is the office of minister and teacher because the word is so important. And like Adam and like Christ, God's representative with that spiritual authority in this age is, is still a man. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the difference between men and women. It's about the call of the office. Now here's, we're talking about counseling. My counsel to everyone would be read different views and don't be afraid to read different views. Study, read good evangelical egalitarians, read good complementarians, study the passage. And I'm going to suggest a book. This is a book of complementarians, and it's called Women in the Church, a Fresh Analysis of 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15. There are different authors of each article. Do you, are you familiar with this book? No. Uh, some of the articles are by, um, one of them's by Steve Baugh. Oh, okay. One of them's by T. David Gordon. Uh, one's by Tom Schreiner, Daniel Doriani. These men are very respectful. Uh, they don't have the type of fear-mongering, accusative language of good egalitarian argumentation. Uh, they're respectful of it and they respond to it. And, and they're very scholarly. And they take sometimes the hard complementarian position, this is my point earlier, that you can have that position and not overreact. So you would consider each one of them to be hard complementarians? It's sort of mixed. Some are hard, some are soft, but it's a complementarian response to egalitarian arguments. Okay. Well, I have nothing but respect for the names you just listed off. So it's a, a wonderful and helpful book. I'm really surprised how few pastors know about this book. Okay, well, it's definitely going on the show notes page. Great. And the next counsel would be, do not let the hard comps who are so loud about this and the patriarchalists redefine the debate. Don't let them intimidate you to study, to think for yourself. Don't let them suggest that if you don't agree with their reasons for Paul's uh, forbidding women, that you have to agree with their reasons, that you have to agree with the scope of what you think Paul is referring to. Um, don't let them intimidate you to have a different view, whatever they call you. Um, simply stick with the text as best you can. And if you come to a hard composition, that's fine. Um, but be humble enough to recognize that there are different views and it's a difficult passage. And I would also recommend the OPC General Assembly Report, which is a really good balance. Okay, well, we'll link to that too. Well, if we didn't rile enough feathers this week, Chris, next week we talk about marriage and submission in marriage. Do you think this is controversial? <laughs> Just when I think uh, we, we've reached the peak of controversy, you keep claiming higher. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you stay with me. <laughs> yep. I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Um, it's been another really great discussion. All right, good place to stop then. Okay. Well, um, please do keep your comments and your questions coming. Uh, you can always email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet at us. I am at Machen Guy. Todd is at T Bordeaux. The podcast itself is at Glory Cloud Pod. Um, I'm also on Instagram as at Machen Guy. And you can also join the discussion over at the Meredith Klein Facebook group. Just let the admins know that you listen to the podcast and they can get you added. And Todd and I will be back again with more of Meredith Klein Applied next week. <laughs>